Last week, yeah, go ahead and celebrate, because last week we uh, baptized 32 people at the lake on Sunday afternoon, and uh, yeah, that is, that is something to get excited about. You've already seen, uh, well, we had two this service, we had two last service. Uh, God is doing a work in people's lives, and we celebrate life change. I love watching people publicly declare that Jesus has changed their lives, and they are a new creation. So if, uh, if Jesus Christ is your Savior, and by that we mean that you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life, uh, and yet you haven't been baptized, we would love to help you be obedient to Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, that's what we love to do. We love to help people obey Jesus. And since he commanded us to be baptized, if that's something that you feel like you want to do, need to do, that God is leading you to do, then just let us know and we will make it happen. Just stop by the Connection Center on your way out. Uh, see a pastor and say, hey, uh, I want to schedule a baptism. Email the church office. It's fine. We'll set it up. Anytime, any place where there's a crowd and there's water, we're good. So, uh, and we've had people challenge us on that, and, and we're fine with that. So, uh, it doesn't matter if it's the, the lake, it doesn't matter if it's a swimming pool, it doesn't matter if it's uh, here at the church. In fact, we got one more baptism scheduled for this afternoon, uh, and so uh, God is working in people's lives. So, uh, uh, we just want to challenge you that way. If God's leading you that way, let us know. We'd love to help you obey Jesus. And it just so happens that our text today is about baptism. So if you'd take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We're continuing our study through the book of Romans. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1120 and you will find Romans chapter 6. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, you need one, then please take one of these with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, that God will change your life. So Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul wants us to understand the meaning of baptism. So let's talk about the picture of baptism. The picture of baptism. Romans chapter 6, I'm going to read the first four verses as we start walking through this passage. The apostle says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Did you see the picture of baptism in that text? That baptism itself symbolizes Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That in that act of obedience in baptism, that, that we're expressing our faith in Jesus Christ. Now understand, baptism itself doesn't save anybody. The act of baptism doesn't save anybody. That, that water in the, that tub over there is not holy. The water to the lake is definitely not holy. Uh, but baptism is when we declare to the world that Jesus has changed our lives and we are faithful followers of Jesus Christ, unashamed of him being our Lord. And, and so when we get baptized, it, it aligns with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. First of all, the death, because it says in there that we were died with Christ in, in baptism. We died with him. So when you confess Jesus as Lord... When you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then what you're saying is, hey, my old life is done. My old life is dead, and I am a new person. I'm a new uh, being. I, I've been recreated by God. And I don't know if you noticed this or not. You couldn't tell on the video, but every time before we baptize, we ask somebody, is Jesus your Savior? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? We give them an opportunity to confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. And so they're saying, I'm dead to the old person. I am a new creation. And then at that point, what do we do? We place them down into the water. Some of you think we're dunking them. We're, we're burying them in the water. And sometimes you can hear us say, buried with Christ. Because Jesus was placed in a tomb. His body was placed in the ground. Well, in the ground, in, the, in a rock cliff. Uh, in a tomb, but he was laid down. And so when we take people down into the water, it's a picture of being buried like Jesus. Being buried with Christ. Of course, we know what happened three days later, right? Jesus 
rose from the dead. We don't wait three days. We bring them up a lot faster than that. Okay? So if you're thinking about baptism, don't worry about that part. So, but when we bring somebody up out of the water, it is a picture of the resurrection. That just as Jesus walked out of the tomb, so you're coming up out of that water and you're a new creation, a new person. God has changed you on the inside. That's what baptism means. That's what it symbolizes. Does that make sense to you? I think this service actually said yes, so thank you. Does it, uh, really, I want you guys to get this. Does, does that make sense to you? Does that, this whole picture of baptism resonate with you? Okay, because some of you grew up in church, like I did, seeing baptism, but no one ever explained it. They just said, you got to do it, so get in the tub. <laughs> and, and others of you are new to this whole church thing, and so, you know, no one's ever really explained baptism, and you kind of go, it's just weird. Because let's be honest, if you're walking in off the street, first time in church in your whole life, and you see what we did to those kids this morning, you're thinking, that is strange stuff. I mean, first of all, it's the only building you ever walk into that's got like a little mini swimming pool in it, right? And, and it's over there and thinking, well, these people are getting in this little, you know, just giant bathtub. Uh, and then this guy's dunking these kids, uh, you know, in front of a room full of strangers. That's just odd. So I want us to understand what we're doing, what it means, what that symbolism is. I also want you to understand why we don't baptize infants here at Calvary. Every so often we get asked by a new parent, hey, would you baptize our babies? And we have to say, no, we, we don't baptize babies here. And, and, and by the way, how many of you were baptized as a baby? Okay, a lot of hands go up. You know what that was? That was a declaration of your parents' faith. It's a beautiful picture of your parents' faith. They did what they'd been uh, taught to do and explained to do to declare their faith in God. But see, baptism is your faith being expressed. It's you telling the world that you have decided to follow Jesus with your life. Not somebody else deciding for you, not somebody else hoping it's going to stick, but you saying, I'm a new creation, and I want the world to know that Jesus Christ has changed me. And so it took me a long time because I, I grew up in a, in a tradition that didn't celebrate infant baptism. In fact, they denigrated it. To understand, that's a beautiful picture of your parents' faith. It's not your faith. So how have you expressed your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you done it in the biblical picture of baptism? Because believer baptism is a celebration of your faith, and it's you identifying with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. So again, if you've never declared your faith in biblical baptism, we would love to help you obey Jesus. So after we see the picture of baptism, then the Apostle Paul talks about the power of death. Listen to how many expressions of death are in these next few verses. Beginning at verse 5. He says, for if we have been united with Jesus in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Wow. Uh, now before I dive into this, uh, I just have to tell you, I wrote this before the very public suicides that occurred this week. And so I want to be really clear about something. When we're talking about the power of death, we're talking about a spiritual death, not a physical death. A spiritual death where Paul is obviously writing to people who are very much alive. And he says, you've died with Christ. You've been crucified with Christ. And, and so he's talking about a spiritual act that we're doing. And, and so I share that because I know there's some of you in this room that are sitting here that are struggling with depression. that are struggling with uh, life. And you've actually bought into the lie from Satan that your life is not worth living that you would be better off dead, that you uh, need to go ahead and hasten your demise. And I just want you to hear from us that God wants you to live. God wants you to be alive. God wants you to embrace life. He, he's with you. He loves you. He values you. And, and not only him, but the people who are a part of your life love you and value you, even if you don't feel it right now. Because we're there for a lot of tragedies, a lot of suicides, and we see the brokenness and the pain and the hurt and the sorrow that accompanies families sometimes for generations. 
And so if you're here and you're broken and you're struggling and you're thinking, uh, I might just end it all, please talk to someone. Talk to your family. Talk to us. We want to help you. We want to encourage you. We want to get you counseling. We, wanna, we just want to walk alongside of you in your darkness until that day that the light shines again. So don't give up. We don't want you to give up. We're talking about the power of death, but we're not talking about the power of physical death. Spiritual death. Paul uses that phrase or refers to it nine times in this passage, in case you weren't counting, in those six verses. And we don't really like that imagery, do we? I mean, as a culture, as a society, we don't really like to talk about death. I mean, we do when it's a public tragedy uh, and that kind of stuff, but we really want to pretend that it's not going to happen to us. We want to avoid it. We want to ignore it. Uh, I mean, our society is obsessed with what? Staying young. We want to stay young, right? So we do all kinds of things to deny the fact that we're getting old, right? You got plastic surgery, you got facelifts, you got Botox, you got dyeing your hair, you got all this kind of stuff that we do so that we can look young. Problem is, we don't feel young. You know, if you're actually getting older, it starts hurting after a while. And you're like, oh yeah, I can still do all the stuff I used to be able to do not, uh, and, uh, and, you know, or I can, but for a lot less time, and it takes me a lot longer to recover. It just, you know, there, it, there's no denying the reality that with aging uh, comes pain. That, that's part of life. That's what happens. And, and so we try to deny it. In fact, you want to be a conversation killer? You want to just ruin the party? Just look at somebody and say, so, you got a will? <laughs> or how about this? How much life insurance you carry in? I, I don't want to talk about that. Hey, you want to really like totally blow their mind and say, hey, why don't you go ahead and sit down and plan out your funeral service? Yeah, see, that, that freaks people out. Your family will really appreciate it when the time comes, but that freaks people out. We don't want to talk about it. And other than the tragedies and the, you know, the, the suicides and the illnesses that strike down those who are young, why are we ever surprised by death? I, I mean, come on, Scripture actually tells us it's going to happen. It's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. That, that, that's a guarantee. So our expectation ought to be, okay, how are we living rather than uh, I, want, I don't want to talk about dying. And we need to kind of embrace the countercultural viewpoint of Scripture. That's what Paul wants us to do. He's saying, hey, look, understand that death unleashes God's power in our lives. The spiritual death unleashes God's power in our life. Listen to the word of God. Jesus, in the gospel of Luke, chapter nine, he says this, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and come follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he will find it or save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself, his soul? He said, look, if you really want to find life, then take up that implement of torture, deny your selfish desires, and follow me. Embrace that spiritual death. The Apostle Paul chimes in. Galatians chapter 2, he says, For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Did you catch that? I've been crucified with Christ. I, th this old way of life, I am dead to it. It's just like, uh, you know, uh, I'm not living for myself any longer. I'm living for Jesus. Uh, Colossians 3. The Apostle Paul writing to the church there says, If then you have been raised with Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on this earth, for you have died. He's obviously writing to people who are very much alive. You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. He's saying, hey, look, your life is wrapped up in Jesus. It's, it's all about him. So go ahead and embrace the spiritual death and say, hey, look, I, this world's not about me. It's about Christ. There are many more examples, but I hope you get the picture. As Jesus followers, we are to die to our previous life. We are to be crucified with Christ in the spiritual sense. And, and we do that because death leads to life. Death leads to life. 
life abundant and life eternal. Did, did you catch some of these statements? Verse 5. For if we have been united with Jesus in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. You see, Jesus you know, wants to give us life abundant and life eternal. He calls us to let go of that death-filled life of self-destruction, of selfishness, of, of addictions, and to embrace the real life that he wants to give us. But, but it happens when we let go of that life of death and we embrace the, the life that God has for us. And, and yeah, we occupy a world that is filled with death. And we talked about that last week. Uh, but the more we die to our destructive urges, the more we experience the life that God desires to give us. And honestly, and this is just a, a you know, point in fact, if we don't die, we will never experience the eternal life God prepares for us. Uh, death is part of God's redemptive plan. Spiritual death now, physical death eventually, because... What's waiting for us as followers of Christ when we actually exit this world? We get, yeah, we get heaven, and in heaven we get a new body. I am ready to trade in this one. I don't know about anybody else, but, you know, when Scripture says the new one is going to be no more suffering, sorrow, death, or pain, I am all in. Okay? And, and, and that's part of our redemption. Now, some of you, like me, grew up in, in church where, uh, uh, how, do, how do I put this? Um, I was taught to uh, uh, hope for the fact that I wouldn't actually die physically. Any, anybody else grew up in the, the Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth, scare people out of hell or scare the hair out of people? I don't know, one of the two uh, kind of thing. Okay, so you, you grew up like that way and, and here was the promise. People say, oh, you know what? You know, Jesus is gonna come again. He is. Uh, and, and he's gonna rapture us out of here so we're not gonna have to die. And when you're 18, that sounds pretty good. Can I just say that if you've been holding out for that hope, the odds are not in your favor. All right, Scripture never makes that promise, but, uh, you know, if it happens, great, but you might as well get prepared for the fact that God at one day is going to redeem you through death. And I say redeem because this is what happened in the Garden of Eden. Uh, you know, last week I challenged you guys to read Genesis 1, 2, and 3 because uh, we talked about how death came into the world. So here, here's what happened. Adam and Eve sinned against God. They, they defied God when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then God kicked him out of paradise, and he guarded the tree of life. He didn't want them to live forever in a state separated from him. So he redeems us through Jesus and his sacrifice, and he redeems us forever. Because one day we get to trade these corrupted bodies for those perfect ones, and that sounds like a really good deal to me. So death leads to life. So die to your sin and discover the life that God has for us, and death leads to freedom. It leads to freedom. Did you notice verses 6 and 7 uh, again in this text? just want you to hear the words. We know that our old self was crucified with Jesus in order that this body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. See, before Jesus came, we were all slaves to sin, period. We had no choice. We were slaves to our selfishness, our rebellion, our self-destruction. It's our nature. But Jesus died to change that. He died to set us free, to free from the slavery of sin, free from the fear of death, free from the inevitable judgment. So if you're stuck in your destructive habits, if you're watching your marriage and your family implode, if you're feeling lonely or broken or despairing, Paul calls you to embrace the spiritual death that leads to freedom. Uh, because when we die to our addictions, we discover freedom to live. By the way, if you're struggling with that, we've got a ministry called Celebrate Recovery that meets Monday nights at 6.30. And for the next two weeks, because we've got Adventure for the City here, they're going to be meeting at Titan Gym right across the highway. So, uh, if that's you, check it out. 6.30, I know it sounds weird, Titan Jim, but they're partners with us, so we're gonna just go ahead and use their space. Now, when we die to selfishness, we discover love in our marriages and our families. 
I know a lot of people who want to have a better marriage. They want to have a better family. And sometimes they even pray and ask God to fix their spouse or their kids. Can I just encourage you to go home and look in the mirror and say, you have a problem. See, we want God to change other people so that we can be lazy and just stay the way we are, and that's selfish. And what's going to happen is if you'll ask God to heal you of selfishness, if you ask God to teach you how to love like Jesus, how to serve like Jesus, how to forgive like Jesus, how to give grace like Jesus, it will radically change your relationships. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your family. It'll change your relationship with your kids. It it will happen when you die to that selfishness. When we sacrifice our self-centered agenda, we discover freedom and joy in relationships and we discover purpose in life, but we have to choose death to get there. So here's the question. Are you living free? Are you still captured by sin? Are you living free? Are you still captured by sin? Because a lot of times in church, we, we'll ask that question, and then we'll kind of wrap up the service and send people out. And there's a lot of people who are kind of like, yeah, I'm still kind of struggling with a lot of sin in my life. I'm still, you know, enslaved in some places in my life because most of us are not living as free as God intended. But then at that point, we kind of, as pastors, tend to pull the punches and, and people sit there and Holy Spirit convicts you and kind of points part of your life out and says, hey, you know, you should change this. You should repent of that. And and then you just walk out the door promising yourself you're going to live differently, and we don't. And we just continue on in that slavery. So I don't want to do that. Um, here's, Here's what I know. Unless we get honest about us with God, we're going to stay stuck in that place of slavery to sin. Unless we get really honest about what we're struggling with and who we are, we're, we're just going to stay stuck. And by the way, honest, being honest in Scripture is the word confession. See, the churches I grew up in, nobody wanted to ever confess uh, because that, then people would be you know, judging them and all that kind of stuff. And so people just carried their secrets with them and lived in slavery. And they would talk about half the confession thing. You know, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness, which is absolutely true and a wonderful promise from God. But it's only half the equation. You know what the other half is? Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. That you might be healed. You see, if we walk out the store and the only person who knows our stuff, our secrets, is God, then those secrets are going to own us and destroy us. But when we have the courage to step into the light and to bring our junk into the light, then God can start healing us through the people, uh, people around us who love us and who love God and want to help us overcome that stuff. And I've already mentioned that, that, you know, we've got avenues for that. But I'm just going to tell you right now, if, if there's some stuff you're keeping secret and, and you know it's destroying you, then I'm going to challenge you to get honest with yourself, with God, and with somebody else. It might be a friend. It might be a spouse. It might be the prayer team here at the front after the service. They'll pray for you today and continue to intercede for you throughout the week. It might be one of the pastors, and you go, I don't want to talk to the pastor when there's 100 people around. Then make an appointment. Well, we'd love to sit down with you and hear your story and, and help you to understand God's grace for your life. It might be counseling. It, it might be uh, celebrate recovery. There's so many avenues for you to find a way to get honest about yourself and about your life and your struggles so that Christ can set you free. See, when we die with Jesus, we're a new creation raised to walk a different kind of life. Is that your real- reality or are you still captured by sin? Because so many of us are captured by sin, let's discuss the problem of zombie Christians. That was not what you were expecting to write in that blank, was it? Every service has kind of been like, did he just say that? Yes, he did. The problem of zombie Christians. Let's continue verse 12. doesn't use the word in the Bible, but you'll see what I'm saying. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life. 
And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. So I think there's a problem with zombie Christians, but since I brought up the idea of zombie Christians, I got to talk about zombies for a minute. How many of you are zombie fans? Okay, why is there just like six people raising their hands in here? All right, let me rephrase this. How many of you ever watched the, you know, The Walking Dead, Fear of the Walking Dead, World War Z, any of the zombie movies, even The Night of the Living Dead? Come on, put your hands up, put them up high. We're, look, every service is the same way. Ten times as many people raise their hands when we go get honest. We just talked about honesty and we still lie, see? I don't want people to know I watch that stuff. Look, I've watched that stuff. Uh, so, so here's the deal. I want you to understand that you do not have to fear a zombie apocalypse. I'm going to give you a, a brief theology of zombieism and, uh, and help you to understand that that's entertainment and not truth because the zombie apocalypse can't happen. Uh, first of all, it can't happen because it's not biblical. Hebrews 9.27, I've already referenced it a couple times. It is appointed unto man wants to, what? Die and then judgment. You don't get to hang out in some, you know, zombie state or whatever. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is talking about possession because the Pharisees are accusing him of having a demon. And he says, hey, you guys don't understand this. If you're going to break in and steal from somebody's house, you have to overcome the guy who lives there first. You've got to bind the strong man. You've got to be stronger than the strong man. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the strong man in you is the Holy Spirit of God. He owns you, he owns your life, and if anyone's gonna take over control of your body, guess what they have to do? They have to, take, they have to kick the Holy Spirit out, and there ain't nobody who can do that. In fact, Scripture says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So that means that you can't be zombified, you can't become a vampire, you can't become uh, any kind of undead creature that the horror movies wanna, wanna say happens. And as Jesus was addressing, you can't be possessed by an evil spirit if you're a follower of Jesus. Now, you can be manipulated to, deceived, lied to, but you cannot be coerced because the Spirit of God is in you and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We need to understand biblical theology and what that means for our lives. So, um, You can't be a zombie, a vampire, undead. Uh, You also, just for those of you who grew up in the fear-mongering Christian days, you can't receive the mark of the beast. Okay? Again, grew up on those Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth, uh, left behind series, all that kind of stuff. And they were always telling us, oh, you can't use a credit card. You can't do this kind of stuff because you receive the mark of the beast. Can I just tell you something? If that's a fear of yours and a lot of, you know, long-term Christians carry that, can't happen. If you read the Bible, you learn this stuff, okay? Just telling you, Revelation chapter 9, uh, Revelation 13 is where it talks about the mark of the beast, but Revelation chapter 9, you know what it says? It says if you belong to Christ, God has already marked you, sealed you with his name on you. God's claimed you. You're his. And again, ain't nobody going to kick God out. Ain't nobody going to say, hey, oh, oh God, I got him instead of you. No, you belong to Christ, You're his. You're safe. So, you can't be a real zombie, but you can be a zombie Christian. You know, what's a zombie Christian? Well, think about it. Present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. A zombie Christian is a person who's entered into a life-changing relationship with Jesus but still lives like they were dead. We know the reality of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, but we still live enslaved to sin. We're still caught up in it. See, Jesus brought us from death to life, so why are we choosing death over freedom and life? So let's do a zombie check, okay? Now, this is not for the people sitting around you. I don't want you to go, you're a zombie. I have to shoot you later. Um, That's that's not good. Uh, This is for you uh, to find out that, you know, if you're a zombie Christian or not. So these aren't your notes, but you might want to jot them down anyway. You might be a zombie Christian if there's no joy. There's no joy. If misery and despair mark your life. uh, Think about it. Zombies never throw parties. 
I watch the movies. They don't throw parties. They don't celebrate. They don't laugh. You don't have zombie stand-up comedians or anything like that. It, it, they're just, they're miserable. And yet scripture tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. So how is your joy quotient? Do you celebrate the blessings of God spontaneously, naturally? Or is it something that you have to be prompted for to be grateful and joyful? Because you might be a zombie Christian if there's no joy. And you might be a zombie Christian if there's no relationship or valued relationships. In other words, do you talk with God throughout the week or is it just for an hour on Sundays? Do you actively engage in relationships with your spouse, your children, and your grandkids, and your friends? Or do you just sit around and... You see, you never see zombie weddings. You don't see any sorrow expressed by zombies when the one next to it gets blown away. Right? There's no grieving. There's no sorrow. There's no emotional investment. So how are your relationships? How's your relationship with God? Is it living and active? Is it, is it vibrant in your life? Or do you feel like you're talking to a stranger? How's your relationship with your family? Do you realize that family is the first ministry responsibility that God gives to all of us? So if you're married, how's that relationship? With your kids, how's that relationship? Does it demonstrate that you value them, that you're vested in them, that you weep with them and rejoice with them? How's your relationship with others? By the way, we encourage life group participation because we know that if you're in a life group, it's gonna be a lot harder to be a zombie Christian because you're gonna be sharing life with people and building relationships with them. So you might be a zombie Christian if there's no relationship and if there's no joy. And finally, uh, you might be a zombie Christian if you're self-destructive and destructive to others. You see, every time I see zombies, they pretty much just try to kill and eat people. I mean, that's kind of the zombie purpose, right? Kill and eat people. And you know what I notice about zombies is if um, you cut off their arm or their leg, they don't care. They're still going to try and kill and eat you. They're, they're self-destructive. And they're destructive to others. If you follow Jesus and you're still destroying yourself or you're hurting others, then please wake up and get help. And I've mentioned Celebrate Recovery and I've mentioned counseling and I've mentioned pastors. Uh, we've got classes. Wake up, get help, and repent. Change the direction of your life. That's what repentance means. Changing directions. Don't let sin be your master. You chose Jesus as your master, so follow him and die to yourself. Discover life and freedom. You see, that's what baptism represents. So what are you waiting for? My suggestion is we kill the zombies and we follow Jesus. Let's pray.